Welcome to the Onside Kick. Ricky Widmer here along with Mark Weber. Hey, how's it going, guys? And the reason why I introduced Mark first is because we have a first for the podcast, a first in a very long time. Dave Oster, back on the podcast, joining us. He actually got up to do the podcast because I know you've had a job, Dave. Yeah. It's yeah. been a hard life. It is. Uh, glad to be back, though. Absolutely. I've mi- I missed doing this. The return. This is what it's been about, guys. This is what we've all been waiting for. And trust me, I've been getting a lot of complaints that I'm not on here. i got to keep these guys in line. Don't worry. It's going back to normal. You've been compared to Derek Rose. You have been compared to Tim Tebow. You've even been compared to BJ Armstrong. I- I'm not sure how to feel about those <laughs> last two, but okay. All right. But we're going to have a great podcast. going to talk a lot of NBA, the Brooklyn Nets, their big blockbuster deal, the NBA draft. But we're going to start off probably the last time for a long time that we're going to be talking about hockey. Dave, hockey season's finally over. Yay. Chicago Blackhawks win the Stanley Cup. Their parade was this Friday, and apparently Corey Crawford making some, he's been making some headlines all season, but at the parade, uh, everyone loved, if you want to call it a speech, I know, Dave, you've been saying that he said <laughs> like It's a very two, loose term of speech, but yeah, yeah. He's been saying, he said two things. But uh, what did you guys think of the parade? Dave, I know you have a different perspective because you were actually downtown for it. Uh, I thought he got the message across. I, I, I'm i a fan of it. Uh, the the absolute atmosphere downtown was crazy. I mean, Blackhawks fans everywhere. The whole city was going nuts. It, it was just an awesome time. Well, there were more people. It seemed like to me more people were there this year than were there in 2010. Well, definitely. I mean... Having the first win, people kind of start to cheer for the team. And then the second win, you know, everyone's cheering now. But I really think, imagine being, and this is one reason, Ricky knows, I don't like I don't like being in big crowds. It's not my thing. Too many people. Imagine being one of the, like, thousands of people back in the very back. And you're sitting there looking at a little pea-sized Patrick Kane. To me, I don't know. I'd rather watch it on my TV. Well, I don't know. I'm a. I agree with you. I rather watch on my, on my TV. But they do have big screens out there. They got big screens at your football game too. But at least then you can see them. They're not pea size. They're action figure size. Look, it's all about going downtown and sharing your love of the team, the sport, with everybody else. It's just a great atmosphere, like minded people. You know. Well, exactly. And I mean, the one thing, the best thing I loved about the parade, because I watched it at home because, Mark, I'm like you. I don't like big crowds that much either, especially with after seeing how many people were at this parade. <laughs> the best part, Pat Foley, MC for the parade, was going through. Who did we beat in the first round? When he gets to the second round, he's like, and we beat the Wings. All of a sudden, you just hear, Detroit sucks. Detroit <laughs> sucks. They do. Well, I mean, honestly, I love it so much. We kicked them out. I I like to look at this as we kicked them out of our conference by knocking them out of the playoffs three in a row there. It's a nice send-off message, yeah. Yeah, it's get the f*** out. We, We let you get so close. We let you get one win away from moving on, and then we snatched it from you. (laughs) Yeah, the Blackhawks just said, get out. We don't want to see you guys anymore. We're done with you. But you know what's the one thing, and this is the last thing I'll say about the parade, that I heard it on one of the local news channels here in Chicago. Apparently, Brian Bickle, a guy we've said that the Hawks need to re-sign this season, apparently he's coming out and saying that he'll take the quote-unquote hometown discount to stay in Chicago. It's nice to hear, and I think this is my thought on this. We want him back. He wants to come back. Let's see what happens when those paychecks start coming in. Because when those offers come in, he's got to do what's best for him and his family. Does he want money or does he want cups? That's what I say. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see, but I don't really hold it against the guy if he's going to go get big money somewhere. You know, he's got to do what he's got to do for him and his life. Um... As long as he doesn't go to, you know, Detroit, Boston, Pittsburgh. I don't think think he'd go to Detroit. I don't think, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see because I think Detroit's going to come at him with big money. Okay, guys, now to move into the main topic of the podcast this week, blockbuster deal in the NBA, and it's with the Brooklyn Nets, Boston Celtics. I think it's stupid. KG Pierce and Terry go to Brooklyn. The 
Nets basically send a bunch of players and three first round picks to the seas. I like to call it the retirement home deal because that's where they're all going to be in about four years. I mean, the the big thing to take away from this trade is the Nets are looking to win now. They've set their timeline up to if they're not going for a championship in the next three years, it's it's over. They're they're completely screwed over because, like you said, they gave up those first round picks already. So now they've got a, an extremely veteran roster. So. I really don't know what they plan on doing because, honestly, it looks like a good team, but I don't see any change here that defines them out as, oh, now they can compete against the Heat and they can win it. I I see two things with this. Um, the first thing I see is, obviously, the, you know, we got to win this now kind of situation. The second thing I see is just desperation. You know, it's a desperate move of, it's kind of the thing that everybody did after Miami Heat. Miami Heat bought their big three. I need to just buy the next three superstars I can possibly get. And that's somewhat what this is. I mean, it's through a trade, obviously. But it's just, let me just buy three veteran players who've done this before and hope we can do it. And it even admits that the last year, that roster that they kind of Frankensteined together in some ways, they're kind of admitting... This isn't working. We need to figure something else out. So let's just buy new guys. Well, and I mean, the the first thing I think of is kind of, I was watching ESPN and they had Legler talking about it. And he says that, oh, well, the Brooklyn Nets look like one of the top teams in the East. He pauses and then says the key word on paper. Yeah, I'm sorry. I still have the East going Heat, Bulls, Pacers, yeah. Knicks. See, I the top four. I, I still don't see any change. The one thing I think, though, with the Nets is if they're gonna jump anyone in the East, it'd be the Pacers. That's it. That's really? the only team. The but, Pacers didn't even have Danny Granger, and they were probably one of the toughest teams. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm saying if there's one team that is gonna get knocked out of that top three, I would say it's the Pacers. Do I see it happening? No. But if it does, that's the team. I could see maybe the Knicks falling off because they lost J.R. Smith. But I don't know. I, th- this team has potential because they do have, I mean, bring in Terry and Pierce. You got well, that Terry's, Terry's going to come off the bench, and yeah. he's going to be that three-point presence off exactly. the bench. I just have an issue where you really think that your Brooklyn Nets roster is going to listen to Jason Kidd right now. You got guys who were just playing with Jason Kidd. KG will. KG, even though he's coming to town, KG's a guy. He'll listen I, to Kidd. My only thought is, I mean, you got these guys who, you know, they've gone— They've done great things on the court, and so has Jason Kidd, but now you're going to put these guys who were once in the same level, you know, they they were just equals a little bit ago, now you're expecting these people to go to a new team, you got a new chemistry, you got a new coach, and you're just going to hope it gels? It doesn't, it doesn't yeah. make any sense to me. This is the worst spot for Kidd to be in right now. And like I've said I, multiple times, I think I don't think it's the worst spot because you, you he gotta could think, be in the Bobcats. He's I mean, he could be in a bad team, but he's in a team with egos. He's in a team with veterans who all are gonna be like, I know what I'm doing. I don't need to listen to you, who you know, you new coach, who I played against, I've beat before. Yeah. See, I think that I the one thing I think that Jason Kidd brings to the Brooklyn Nets that's a good thing is. A, re- a, rela- a relatability because, I mean, there's been the joke that, oh, he's going to be a player coach where he's going to be coming he's, off the he's bench, off the bench one playing of himself. But, I mean, he's basically going to be a player coach who doesn't play. I can see him getting a breakaway suit. He's got the jersey on underneath. Come on. <laughs> you know what's going to happen. I, I thought Kobe would be the first player coach before uh, Jason Kidd. Yeah, Kobe's no coach, let's be honest. The but, good news from the Nets, though, is they get rid of Gerald Wallace. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, the only besides getting rid of Wallace, though, the three con, the three contracts Mrs. that Humphreys. they get, Mrs. Well. Humphrey. No one cares about Mrs. Humphrey. But it was a big contract. He was, and in the three contracts that they get from the Celtics, how long are they going to have those? Yeah, yeah. I mean, not expiring years, expiring right. age. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. Thank you. <laughs> but and, I mean, I think out of these, the three that they get from Boston. The most important is KG because, I mean, Paul Pierce, the thing I question about him is how is he going to clash with Joe Johnson? Severely. And I honestly, you're talking about the age, you're talking about, um, you know, KG and everything, but I wonder 
is everyone going to be healthy? That it is asking a lot at this point. You're right. I mean, we see it even even with Miami. Everyone's saying, you know, Dwayne Wade. He's only 32, but those knees are like they're 50. You know, yeah. and that's the same situation that you're buying right now. KG with the back issues, the leg issues. I mean, you got Pierce out there. P- the, the weird thing is, this is going to be uh, a big transition for him. I see mostly because, like, Pierce has that play style that worked perfectly in Boston. Like, the system was kind of built around him getting those shots in the mid-range foul line area. And now I'm like, okay, so how are you going to run this offense? Because you've got KG down low. I mean, Pierce and Terry are spot-up shooters. But then you got Joe Johnson, like you guys were saying. And then you got Darren Williams, who his change, his play style has changed in the past three years. Uh, he went from that aggressive uh, drive-to-lane guy. Now he's still going passing, sometimes... Fun. He he seems to not be able to make up like what defines him as a player. See, and that's a one of the big things about the Nets that I see from this is their identity. Yeah. And you bring up Paul Pierce. What was Paul Pierce arguably in Boston? He was their leader. Yeah. He was their fearless leader. And I feel like with the Nets, I look at Garnett, I look at Pierce, I look at Joe Johnson, I look at Darren Williams, and I just say, Who's the leader of this team? And in my opinion, it has to be Williams. Williams has to be the guy that says, hey, I got to be the leader for these guys. It's going to be hard, though, because you have Pierce and Garnett, who Pierce was basically the leader in Boston, and Garnett was his number two. Yeah, and Garnett just brings a certain level of intensity to a team as well. The knuckle push-ups. I, I honestly, that that's something I think this team gets more credibility. Uh, it's definitely now a tougher team, but I'm, I'm just not buying into it as much. I mean, look how long it took Miami to put that like congeal as a team. So I, I think there's a lot of different play styles that are going to clash when they uh, match up starting five and even Terry coming off the bench. But I, it, they've de- they definitely have potential to put together a solid run. It comes down to health and how fast they can uh, match up their play styles. And you know who's the one person I feel most sorry for in this deal? Who? Rajon Rondo. <laughs> He's sitting there just kind of hoping that that uh, 2014... 2016 and 2018 pick all in the first round. Well, and I he's mean, hoping the Nets kind of tank so yeah, they but can get we, those good picks. I don't think the net the Nets aren't going to tank so much to where they're in the lottery. No, they those got three way too pick, much talent. Those three picks. I mean, maybe I don't know. I can't talk about the 18 and 16 pick, but that 2014 one, that's not going to be a lottery well, pick. All you have, I mean, seriously, are Garnett, Pierce, Terry. Are they going to last long enough? To where that 2016 and that 2018 pick is still going to be a high pick? I would I don't say, think so. I would say the 2018 pick is where we would see that two, the Celtics that, getting a lottery pick yeah, out of this deal. Yeah, that's a guaranteed lottery in 2018. But the question is, do you think Rondo would still be in the Celtics no. in 2016 No. If they're not giving him anything to work with, they just traded away everything that he had. It depends on, it depends on what they do next draft. That's what I think with Rondo. It, what pieces are you going to add for me next year? Yeah, I mean, there, there will be some more free agents. They obviously will have the cap room. The only issue, like we said, was you know Humphrey's contract, Wallace's contract are a bit big. But Brooks, Joseph, and Bogan's nothing to worry about. So they, they do have a decent core to build around with Rondo there. But I just don't know what exactly they were hoping to accomplish. I mean, okay, cool. You you got rid of all the guys who had won you a championship minus Rondo. I think so, it's kind of like what the thing I think of. It's kind of like a bad breakup where it started with Doc Rivers. Doc goes to L.A. and they get a first round deal out of that. I want to say that pick was 2015. Was a first rounder when they sent Doc to the Clippers. And at that point, it's like okay, well, we broke up with Doc Rivers. I don't want to even remember that time. I don't want. It's kind of like when you break up with your girlfriend. But they won a championship doing it. Yeah, you did, but you don't want to remember those good times. You ship them all away. You're looking towards the future. That's what this is. It's a bad breakup. All right, I I can kind of buy into that. Yeah, because honestly, if you brought in anybody else there to coach Pierce and KG, no, there, there's no respect level there. I think that that might be one of the reasons that they're trying to make this work is because you know that respect level. I mean, they're both very good players, very talented, and Garnett is known um, to be like a, a really good guy, but it's just the fact that it's like new coach comes in, comes in with no credibility. Jason Kidd, 
they played against him. They know him. Yeah, he's, he's been, been a around player forever. in the league. He's been around forever. So I think but that maybe helps them. You're going to expect someone to go, we just played the game together. We were going against each other. See, I Now think, I'm going to listen to you as my nah, coach. See, you're going to tell me what see, to I do. See, I think you're taking too much into it that he has to be like the Phil Jackson where there has to be that age difference. I don't think there does because Jason Kidd's going to come in He's going to be like that to Darren Williams because he's obviously older than Williams. Yeah. But to Kid and Garnett, it's going to be much that relatability. Like, hey, guys, come on. You know what's going on. And plus he can, you know, he was just out there playing, so he knows how to, like, train them up for practice-wise, his routine, his schedule. I think he's going to uh, try to bring some of that to the Brooklyn Nets because they got he's he was in the league for 17 years, I want to say. It, regardless, a very long time. He was mostly healthy, and I think he definitely brings a lot of experience to this team. Just from just from a point of view, I think his last year he ended up becoming like a player coach anyway. Towards the end, he was more of a role model for the younger guys to look up to and you know share his experience with. Plus, it doesn't hurt that you know when he played in New Jersey when the Nets were in New Jersey, brought him to two NBA Finals. Yeah, the city loves him. That that also does help. But I want to move from, we kind of mentioned his name. I want to ask you guys what you think. We talked about Jason Kidd becoming a new head coach in Brooklyn. What about Doc with the clip show? What do you guys think about Doc moving to L.A.? It's going to be interesting. Um, I think L.A. is kind of in a situation where they get attention. They've been getting all the highlights and everything. And this year, people thought maybe L.A. can actually make a run. And by L.A., I mean the Clippers all of a sudden, not the Lakers. Um and I think getting Doc Rivers is them basically saying, we need to get something to show for all the highlights, all the hype, all the jersey sales. Or was it them saying, hey, Chris, please come back? I think that definitely has a lot to do with it. Um, Doc Rivers is probably a top five coach in this league, no one would argue with. And that definitely brings some brings something to the team because I'm I'm sorry, but they they didn't have like that level of professionalism. They didn't have... Like a top end, they seemed like a bunch of kids playing an extremely uh, highlight street reel, ball. street ball type play, and that's awesome. But that's not going to get you a championship. They need structure and they need experience, and he brings both of those to this team. See, I don't know. I felt like I feel like I'm repeating myself, but you know who I kind of feel sorry for? Vinny Del Negro. Why? Why because do you feel sorry? for the second team in a row, he gets ousted after. A good season. He had a better season with the Clippers than he did when he was in Chicago. Yeah. Now another coach comes in. Who replaced him in Chicago? Oh, yeah, that's right. Tom Thibodeau. How's he doing? So so the real question here is who wins the Vill- Vinny Del Negro lottery? Because <laughs> all they have to do is suffer for, with him for a couple years, and bam, they get a top-tier coach. That's what I'd be looking at. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing. That's Timber what I'm saying. Wolves, huh? huh? <laughs> But, I don't know. I, no, I, I think I think this definitely increases the chance CP3 stays. Um, do you think he will for sure stay, or will he shop the market a little bit? You have he, to test the market. Yeah, I was going to say, it, it would be stupid not to test the market. Regardless of your feelings towards the team, you have to know your value out there and what other teams are interested. And I'm going to just throw this at you, Dave. Mark, you can get into odds that uh, CP3 kind of goes with Dwight Howard and they package uh. deal somewhere. Because that is pretty tempting. It is. And and the idea is smart. Um, obviously, we've seen the results. It happened in, uh, this, with the Celtics and the Heat. But the thing is, if he's look, if Dwight Hard rumors are you know accurate right now, he's really looking into going to the Rockets. And there's not really a great place for CP3 there on the Rockets well, uh, I mean, with you the got emergence of Jeremy Lin. Jeremy Lin and Chandler Parsons. Yeah, and those guys are tight. So I don't see him following there. I, I think the only way that he'll follow Dwight Howard is if they make something happen with Atlanta, and that's even a long shot. So, no, I, th- I think I think CP3 is going to stay in L.A. I don't know. It's tough for me because I I can see CP3 going elsewhere, but I don't package him with Dwight Howard because I just don't think it's going to happen. I think it seems right now that Howard is heading to Houston. And I don't really know. Do you know. think he's going to go to Houston? I do. I think he he kind of wants he wants to have that meeting and he wants to basically have it where it's saying my last big three wasn't working out. You know, let me meet with your stars and let's see if we can gel and get a big three going over here. Because I don't think he... 
I don't really see him going to, you know, like Atlanta. And besides that, where else is he going to go? Well, right now with Dwight, apparently Tuesday, he has a meeting with the Dallas Mavericks in yeah. L.A. And then later this week, he's going to meet with Houston and the Lakers. So, I mean, he's those not, are the, he's those are the big three bidders. He's not yeah. staying in L.A. There's no chance he stays yeah, in L.A. Yeah, but if you're point. the Lakers, you have to oh, you have to make a case. Did, did you see but the posters you, they're putting up around town? Yep. Saying, yep. I, mean, I think that's the stupidest thing ever. With him going ever. to Dallas, why would he... Can anyone, does anyone think that Dwight Howard and Mark Cuban work together? Does anyone do. think... Really? How? They're wacky enough. But yeah. see, they're so wacky to where it's going to be opposite and directions. Mark, and Mark, Mark Cuban, Mark, Mark Cuban, Cuban has shown he can put together a team. But he's going to be the guy who says, "I'm not going to put up with Dwight Howard." If he's going to say anything and be, you know, an oh, idiot, yeah, he's very. I'm calling him out. But I think that they both have the same goal in mind, which is to make the Mavericks a star city in terms of an NBA team and try we'll to draw bring, more attention. We'll bring them back to Providence. Yeah, well, back to they never yeah. were. I'm sorry. They won well, one they championship, w- and I don't care. The TV <laughs> Reigns were shit that year. Obviously, they weren't a favorite team, you know? So I think I think he's trying to bring a star to the city and really light the place back up as like a showtime thing. But Dirk passed his prime, so I think he could fit in there as far as personality-wise. But the, the thing is, they're not going to compete for a championship just with that one addition. They'd really need to clean up the roster a bit, make some other ads. I think him with the Rocker, Rockets is a really good fit. Um, I'm just allows- confused by that because the Rockets just went out and paid big money for a former Bulls center in Omira Sheik. Big money, but not capped money. No. That's, that's the thing. And it allows them to either A, move a Sheik after that fantastic year. Uh, he really proved that he uh, was an offensive weapon as well. He puts up double-doubles nightly. Fantastic player, all effort. Uh, but the thing here, when they bring in Dwight, uh, it's it's perfect because A, they move a Sheik, get more talent to surround him, uh, or B, they put a Sheik on the bench, and now they've got two big men who can each just put up fantastic numbers. And the Rockets, as far as a team composition, awesome. You've got Lynn the Slasher. You, well, it's similar not, set up to what well, they had with just, the Magic. Well, not just that. I'm thinking, think about Jeremy Lynn, who you yeah. just brought up. How much the productivity level of Amari Stoudemire in New York, how did that go up when Lynn was playing instead yeah. of Mello? Big men plus slashing center, yeah. or slashing point guard, fantastic. And Lynn then you have James great... Harden on the outside. Exactly. Like I said, it, it reminds me a little bit of like an improved version of the Magic that what Dwight Howard started with. You've got Howard in the middle, and you've got everybody else's spot-up shooters. Yeah, except it's not just... But now, Random now he has guys. a point guard. Yeah. Now he has a point guard in addition to that, which is fantastic for him. So I think that addition would really turn the Rockets into a uh, championship contender instead of a playoff, like an annual playoff team. See, and one of the only things, and I know I know we're going to get this if Dwight ends up signing with the Rockets, yeah. and I don't want to hear it, is ESPN, all them, he's going to hear the comparisons to Hakeem. To Elijah Wan. Yeah, well, it's no better than him when he joined L.A. and was compared to Shaq. He's True. not going to live up to it, but you know what? It's it's what you have to deal with. And it's something that he doesn't want, and I think he's trying to avoid it, and it's going to be an issue for him because he has already proven, you know, he gets under the media scrutiny, the media pressure, and it gets worse. Does he have to change his personality? That's Mike, what I he think. He can't. He's not going to change his I mean, I... I'm going to compare it to LeBron because early on in the on in LeBron's career, how much do you think the MJ comparisons and the Kobe comparisons weighed in on his his success besides I, not having a team in Cleveland? Uh, it definitely uh, hurt him a little bit, but it's the fact that LeBron was always – he wants people to like him so much that it, it hurt him when they're like, oh, you're not as good as – Yeah, but look, look what happened after, and you could say it was the – he became the villain, but after he basically matured as a player, look what happened. He tried to become a villain, and he choked that year. Yeah, and, and then, then he went he, back to being a nice guy and, and wins two championships. I just think that Dwight needs to. I know that we say it's his personality, but I think he needs to grow up a little bit, mature a little bit, and then he'll be a successful I player. I think he just needs to focus more on the game of basketball instead of himself. Raw talent? Well, instead of himself, yeah, I guess leaning back on his raw talent and his uh, physical stature. I think he just wants to be one of those guys that everyone in history of basketball will remember. Yeah, he transcends the sport kind of yeah. guy. And he's not going to be able to be that, and he's so consumed with wanting to be that that it. I think it ruins his chances with teams. I'm just going to throw it out there. When it's all said and done, 
Where does Dwight sign? Where's your gut feeling right now? Right now, I'm going with Houston. Yeah, same here. And the fact that they have uh, Kevin McHale there, I think it definitely adds to uh, the enticement of Dwight Howard. I'm going to say Dallas. Why? Because, and this please, is going to change, but I'm interested to see what happens on Tuesday because Cuban's coming, Dirk's coming. Right now, I feel like it's kind of up in the air. I'm putting my money on Dallas right now, but that might change. The only reason I think he goes to Dallas is if somebody else you know, who's going to be one of those big guys, gets to go with him. He needs another superstar to go with him to Dallas, and they need to have a surprise, you know, that surprise in the meeting of, by the way, this guy wants to come too. You know, that that's something uh, we, we talked about, Chris Paul, maybe going to Atlanta. That that was the talks we heard earlier. Um, I didn't even consider the Mavericks. Does any... Dallas even have enough money to sign yeah. both of them? That that might be the issue on that one. And if that's but the case, they could get a tier two guy who could help Dwight. But the thing is, the the good the good news is Dirk. Obviously, personality wise, fantastic. Everybody loves him. He's a quieter guy, but his game isn't going to be affected because of his age. He's just that, yeah. he's a shooter, and the man makes more awkward looking shots than anyone I've ever seen. I mean, he's just got a weird body and just an awesome shot. He never misses. Dirkalicious definitions makes a coach's loco. There you go. There you go. <laughs> but, I mean, moving on, still staying in the NBA. The NBA draft was this week. We did, Mark, me and you did a video about the Bulls draft pick with Tony Snell. We're not going to get into that. We're going to talk Are about you sure? the draft. Because I'd like to straighten you guys out a little bit. Uh, you want to straighten it? Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, bring it out. Go ahead, Dave. Straighten us out. What All did right. you have against our video? So, to, to fill you guys in, if you missed on the video, it's up on our YouTube channel. But... Basically, these two clowns up here were talking about how Tony Snell was just a terrible pick for the Bulls. I didn't. We didn't. We never said terrible. We just said waste of a pick. I believe was it Mark. wasn't. I it, might have said waste of a pick. It yeah. wasn't the pick that. It wasn't what we really needed. We needed a shooting guard, and he's not a true shooting guard. He's not a true shooting guard, but he can fill the role of a shooting guard. He's not going to play as the shooting guard, though. Why? Why? Why not? Who? Who got a shooting guard? Rip Hamilton out there with a ventilator or something? They want him to be the shooting guard so badly. But honestly, I would. I'm not going to be surprised to see Jimmy Butler as our shooting guard. And I. I don't think that's a great idea. Well, either, until but. we trade Dang. Ah. We're not going to trade Dang because Dang's going to be on this team you don't think, until he walks you, out. You don't. Bit. You don't think Dang gets moved by the trade deadline? No. Nope. I'm saying by the trade deadline. Nope. I say he's on this team until you're he saying walks. there's not a team that's going to be making a championship run and saying, "Hey, we need to add a guy the like the Bulls Luan. aren't going to trade him. The Bulls don't want to trade him. He is their he's in their core. They've already proven they are not willing to move him, and they can talk about it and they can tease it all they want, but they're never going to pull the trigger. See, here's the thing: Dang is a phenomenal player, yes, but is he worth the money that he's getting paid by the Bulls? Right now, as three Bulls fans, I think we all agree that but no. He the needs Bulls, to take the hometown the discount. The Bulls can't manage money. We've already proven that our management does <laughs> not know how to handle money with that big-ass boozer. boozer contract. Big-ass boozer. That, that, that right there describes his contribution to the city. I mean, that is really what's holding us back right now. If, if by some ridiculous chances we could package boozer plus like draft picks just to dump salary— I'd be all for it. I, I think this team right now has the makings of a team to compete for a championship. It's just the fact that that contract is killing us on filling out the rest of our roster. Yeah, but you got to look at what Boozer was. Boozer was a, oh, crap, we can't get... Because that was the free agency year of LeBron. Yeah, Where LeBron, everyone made Fox a case played. for LeBron. And when he chose Miami, the Bulls basically hit the panic button and was like, we need one of these big free agents. We cannot go home empty-handed, and we chose Boozer. Yeah, it was a it was a bad panic move, though. It, it worked out in the beginning. In it, the beginning, I was happy yeah, with it. Yeah, because it was like, hey, we got a 20-10 and 10 guy. That's awesome. And then he dropped down to, like, a 15-10. and 10. And then, like, Well, because a, a did he have to play with a guy? A... Did he play with a guy <laughs> like Joakim Noah in Utah? No, but Paul Millsap was similar. I'd say that Noah's better. Yeah. Noah uh, brings more numbers to the game. But but here's the thing is is yeah, right now the And Bulls more are, pistols. <laughs> more pistols. <laughs> Joke him Noah, supplier pistols. Yeah, and dra and trash in Cleveland. That that's what he does. Uh but no, right right now the Bulls are in just just a bad situation. It's like, yeah, we're stuck with that massive cap from Rose, who was our key, 
and Noah, who obviously everybody loves and said he probably one of the favorite players. And then it's like you got Dang and Boozer sitting there holding up a ton of cap room, and we got to fill out the rest of this roster. So yeah, that's a bad position. But there, as far as shooting guards go, there's only one thing though that what? I want to say about Tony Snell okay. that I do like. Okay. Defensive ability, and I that's why I feel like that the Bulls might have said, "Hey, let's go with him over a true shooting guard because can't of play defense his defensive and ability." It's not who can't play defense. Who's a six-seven guy who can play defense on the who perimeter? Can cause issues for larger players per se. LeBron guys. James, perimeter guys. I, I I can understand the point of trying to get that guy. You know, basically, essentially to pair up against LeBron James. Yeah, but Jimmy Butler can do that. He can. He definitely so can. So can Kurt Heinrich with but, a good well, bear hug. Yeah, if, if, if Kurt Heinrich yeah, tackles him. someone, that'll that'll stop them from shooting the ball. I just think that <laughs> our genius. our defensive system has been proven that anybody can come in and be successful in. So defense uh, 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 isn't what you go for. Teague. Teague doesn't play. Yeah. Because we don't if you don't let somebody play, it doesn't matter. <laughs> because Thibodeau doesn't like nineteen year old kids with no experience playing defense. But yeah. He should have been in the D League the whole year. That that would have helped him out mature. But no, Tony Snell's a guy who played four years in college, and like his coach, absolutely fantastic reviews from everybody in the system in New Mexico. And it's just like this is a character guy. This is a guy who effort guy, and somebody who brings flexibility. Like you guys said, he's a small forward who plays shooting guard. Who can play shooting who- guard. And placing guards. Thank See, you. See, I just, the one thing I do want to say, though, that we've been getting a lot of comments on the video, mm-hmm. I will say, and I've said this in the comments, I hope with all my heart that Snell proves me wrong. Yeah. Prove me wrong that you were not the right pick. Tell me that you were. Can, can you imagine? I mean, it, it just gives us a gives us more options as far as flexibility on the team. And here, here's the thing that scares me, though. It's like, all right, so if we expect him to bring us, what, probably 10 to 14 minutes off the bench, yeah, maybe, um, because I do see them rolling, like you said, with either Butler or Dang is our two guard for some reason. That's just what we do. You know, we, we, have, we have a lot of those middle-range guys. Uh, Taj in the mix as well. We signed him to a four-year contract. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a weird situation with the Bulls, but I think Snell was really a, a smart pickup. And then our second-round pickup, uh, we got uh, Murphy. Eric Murphy. Murphy, thank you. From Florida. Yeah, who, who's a three-point shooter, which is something that I think we are really too comfortable with having three-point shooters. A little, little Cal Corver out there. Give me some hot sauce, Cal. Give and, me a little bit more. And this past year, without having a three-point shooter, was absolutely well, I mean, miserable. Bell- Bellinelli was, he was no Corver, but he was a three-point oh. shooter. And you had Nate Robinson, who could throw up as many shots as, you know, you'd, you'd give him the ball. You and don't had, touch the ball, that's a and shot. And had the, had the best jump ball ability of any, of any <laughs> point guard in the league. <laughs> Screw up for the jump ball. I'll take the tip. I'll, I'll just wait for the ball to come down. Don't worry about it. But yeah, it's like, without having one of those, it was just like, oh, God. We, we really need to go out and get somebody... Just a specialist, pretty much, to cover that spot. So I think the Bulls did a decent job with the draft. You guys would have... Better than last year. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you guys would have loved to see how... <laughs> did Hardaway I catch you off guard there? Yeah, it did. <laughs> I did. I'm just remembering our reaction from last year's pick of <laughs> to, T. To Marquise T? Yeah. yeah well, when, well, several uh, other when, suitors were on the board Who still. was it? Duran Lamb was still on the board? Duran Lamb. Or not Duran Lamb. The uh, Doran. Doran. Oh, yeah, I just I really wanted them to go with him over Teague, but yeah, I mean, yeah, shooting guard, God for yeah, yeah. Why why do we need one of those? We got to rip Hamilton. We've with needed a, a damn thir- shooting guard for what three years now? <laughs> no, we but still like, haven't gotten figured out. But Dave, you bring up Tim Hardaway Jr. and yeah, I, that, that was your guys. Pick. I personally like him because I mean, look at what he had. The type of pressure I like what he had to deal with in Michigan. Who's his father? Where did he learn everything from? Oh yeah, one of the best players I would say to ever play the game. In Tim Hardaway, he's not Jordan level, but yeah, when you was, when you say Miami he was basketball, elite. he was elite. You say Tim Hardaway, and I mean, I feel like, and this could probably go into a more national spin, but yeah. I feel the Knicks got a steal with him at twenty four. And the only reason you see it as a steal at twenty four is because of his talent. But the thing you have to consider as well is his personality, and it seems like he comes off as that spoiled kid with the rich parents who came up on the right side town, you know, like, oh, I'm already all that, you know. That's the only thing. He's got personality things that aren't so clear from the outside, 
but they give you that kind of pause. They're like, well, do we really want to deal with this guy? But guess what? The Knicks just got done dealing with Jarrett Smith, who's a diva. Yeah. So it's like, uh, yeah, we'll take somebody who can fill that role. You know, we'll, we got rid of the sixth man of the year. Guess what? We just replaced him with a rookie who brings just as much scoring potential and less drama, less hope. So I would have liked to see Hardaway Jr. here. Yeah, but I think it was a character thing is why Thibodeau went with a four-year four year player. That, I will say that's that's one thing after hearing that. I mean, it's nicer to draft someone who's been in college for a while, has developed their game than uh, and developed someone... Developed a personality and who he is than compared someone to who, Steak, who's an immature little... Yeah, yeah. Or, like, you look at how many freshmen were drafted this year. You look... Bennett, first overall. Noel, McLemore, uh, Stephen Adams out of that's Pittsburgh. basketball though. I mean, it's not like we're looking at football where you need a guy to mature for three, four years. In basketball, yeah, it's nice to have the guy mature, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't make that big of a difference. You can have a guy who is eighteen, nineteen, twenty years old come in and be a good player and basically learn in the league because there's no. Unless you've got the raw town of LeBron James. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. There, there's those exceptional cases where... Kobe Bryant. Yeah, those guys who can just completely skip out on college or, you know, that one year in the NBA, and they're already a perfect fit. You know, who cares? We out-talent your entire team already. You just have so many guys that basically get thrown in the deep end of the pool, and that's how they learn. And that's it's how sink the or NBA... swim, you know? Yeah, that's how the NBA operates. So with something like that, I mean... I think Hardaway obviously would have been a great fit. He's going to be an okay fit over in New York. My only issue with it is that he's not going to be playing that much in New York. Well, he's going to be, I think, I agree after hearing what Dave said, he could be the sixth man. Yeah, he, he's definitely looking to fill in the role of J.R. Smith. Uh, the team is going to return back to, I think, the Carmelo Anthony. Um, you'll see Amari still contributing. I mean... It, it'll return back to normalcy. I don't think you'll see him and Carmelo on the floor together too much. I think they'll try to limit that because I was because they the want to get him the ball. Yeah, you'll you'll limit the touches that way. Well, and one thing I want to ask, it's been bugging me. First overall pick, Anthony Bennett. I was surprised the kid out of uh, UNLV. Were you guys surprised when the Cavs didn't trade away the pick? Didn't take Noel. Yeah, honestly, this year it was like. Uh, I figure the GMs are just going Magic Eight Ball. Be like, who do we take now? The Anthony Bennett. Okay, I, I didn't see. I didn't see him going one overall. I thought he was a top five player, borderline. As far as number one overall, kind of, kind of took me by surprise. I think the smart move for the cat. Well, it depends which way you want the Cavs to go. Do you want them to be a playoff contender now, or do you want them to tank a year and then be a contender? And even by tanking a year. You get Nerlens Noel, who has a chance to be the defensive presence. Doesn't matter on his limited ability offensively because you already have the shooters around there. It's like, oh, we got somebody who's a stopper beneath the net. You get somebody who can affect shots anywhere near the rim like we saw Tim Duncan do during the playoffs. It, it just brings a presence to the low post. So I think, yeah, they could have done that and done probably you know a, a 25-30 win season and had a chance to be in the lottery for just the ridiculous amount of talent in the top 10 next year, I mean, yeah, it could be something, or it seems like, hey, we're looking to make something happen. Maybe we're not exactly 100% on some of the young guys we have right now, so we're going to grab Bennett, and we're going to keep seeing how this team develops. See, and the one thing, I'm looking right now at the Cleveland depth chart, and I feel like Cleveland, you have to, you had to go with the win now because of what the city's been through since post LeBron James. Because I mean, the city was like, oh, we're in the playoffs every year. Oh, look, we made it to the finals, even though we got swept by the Spurs. But I mean, getting that taken away, having your hometown kid, it's kind of like if Derrick Rose just said, bye Chicago. Yeah. How the city would, how the city would be in distrust. And I mean, Cleveland's sick of losing. The management's sick of losing. They even said at the at the latest draft lottery, I hope this is the last time we're here for some time. Sure. And, I mean, they have Tristan Thompson. They have Anderson Vergeau. My question is, does Bennett start right away? And if he does, do you move Tristan to the center? Do you play Bennett at the center? Do you pull him off the bench? What do you do with him? Don't put Bennett at the center. I don't. You're not going to put Bennett at the center, I don't think. 
you drafted this guy one overall to be, you know, the power forward. Is he going to start right away? Probably. I think he should. Well, he's the first overall pick. Yeah, yeah. he's going to have to start. And that's a, that's a thing with, you know, Noel. They couldn't take him. You're not going to take a guy who's not going to play for until at least December, if not more. Correct. Number one overall. You just can't do that. You don't go with the, I mean, obviously everybody, you know, every fan thinks, you know, this is the strategy. Suck for that number one pick. But you can't do that. It's not like football. You can't suck for luck. It's not. Yeah. It's not guaranteed. Exactly. Yeah. You just you can't do something like that. You got to do everything in your power to get. Well, it depends if they put that little kid back out there. Then they can do it. Like that's a guarantee. First overall. <laughs> Give us a little kid over there, and we're gonna get that pick. But you just got to do whatever you can to put yourself in a position to win right now. See, and honestly, the only player, I mean, I've been saying this the whole time about this draft, Mm -hmm. and now I can say that basically who's the big winner. The best player in this draft to me has always been Victor Oladipo. The Magic, great selection at number two, but the first thing I think of with Oladipo is, oh, you're in Orlando. Probably not a great situation. Not for him, no. Good pickup by the Magic, though. He's a great guy, great personality, and a great defender. His offensive game has picked up tons since the beginning of his uh, first season there. But it, it, it just comes down to the fact of what else is on the Magic right now that can mm-hmm. help you win games, and then it leaves you with some question marks. I think uh, my favorite pick of this draft would probably be back would be Ben McLemore to, to the, the Kings? Kings. I think that's, uh, that's an interesting pick because he has a huge potential cap, and it's just like, you know... They just got the okay to keep their uh, basketball team in that city, so they're trying to draw an attention. Well, that's the one. This guy is a he has a possibility to make like things happen, like Lillard did last year for well, Portland. That's the one thing I think it was uh, Bill Simmons that said it during the draft was if what didn't happen with Sacramento this offseason, if that never happened, oh, this would be a terrible pick because the management's terrible. But they just resold the team. Yep. It's a new face, new direction. I I like the pick from the Kings. I just I wanted. I'll wait and see with Macklemore how he comes over to the NBA. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Obviously, they couldn't take Oladipo, but I think Ricky and I both agree he's the better one. He's the, he's the better guy in that situation. Unfortunately for them, they didn't have the opportunity to take him. So I would I would rather go with the Magic's pick. You know, number two, it was an obvious pick, but I think he's going to be the guy in this draft class that, you know, five, ten years from now, he's going to be the number one out of this draft class. See, and a move that puzzled me was the move that the 76ers did to get Noel. They yeah. trade Drew Holiday. Like, when I heard the name Drew Holiday, I was like, wait a second, you're going to give him to the Pelicans for a guy who's not going to play until December? Yeah, and this is a very young point guard just coming into, like, the prime of his career who's already an all-star. It's like, what? Who you could probably put as the face of your franchise. Absolutely. I do like the fact that uh, the, the the tweet, can't wait to play with Drew Holiday. Yeah. And <laughs> Come you, on. Go and that's fun. right after you got Noel talking about Block City with the Pelicans. And... That's just the issue. And I, Ricky and I were essentially watching this together. And I told him many times, I can't stand how it's, we drafted this guy. Now we're going to interview him. Now we're going to say what we're going to do with him, you know, five, ten minutes down the line when we can make this new young kid look like an idiot on national Well, TV. I mean, we saw that with a couple. You saw that with Noel was probably the worst. The best one with this, Shane Larkin. Oh. Because <laughs> Shane Larkin goes right up to Shane Battier and he goes, so uh, what are you uh, expecting to do at the next level? And he goes, you know what? I am looking forward to play wherever I go. <laughs> and did he did he end up in Atlanta? No, he ended up in Dallas. And I think that's a good attitude to have, especially for a lot of these young guys. They get so excited about the people they get to play with. That's not what it's about. You get to play NBA basketball. That's enough. That well, should be enough for you. And that's like if I was Trey Burke getting selected by the Timberwolves, first thing that would go through my head is, wait a second. They have Ricky Rubio. Why are they drafting me? Yeah, you have to know right there. And then he gets traded to Utah, and it's like, oh, great, great okay. job by Utah, though. They well, definitely I mean, need a true point guard. They're basically filling in what they used to have a point guard in Darren Williams. He leaves. Now they have a point guard again. Yeah, it, like I said, great pick up there. Um, but yeah, it is kind of funny. We got that. Like, wait a minute, I'm not going. There's no way they're gonna take me. And it's just like, oh, 
I think uh, a good pickup, though, like you said, um, Kelly Olmec. I thought this, he has, he's got a lot, a lot of good game, but I'm a little, little concerned. And where does he go? The rebuilding Celtics. Yeah. I'm like, smart move to put him there because I think right now, like we said, they have to really build around Rondo and then filling out the rest of that roster because of all these uh, contracts they're just picking up. So it's like, I don't know. It's a toss in my mind. It, it, I kind of like it, but for him, but as a Celtics fan, I think I'd be a little angry because you just gave up all your top tier talent and you go out and get a center. Not not a great pick. Yeah, but I mean, look at who they gave up. They gave up KG, who is you can play either at the power forward or the center. I think if I'm wrong, he was he was playing center towards the tail end of his yes, Boston career. Yeah, they had him as a center because they really didn't have anybody else to go out there. I just think that for Celtics fans, you see all these guys you've been cheering for for so long. Um, they've done great things, and they're gone. And now this is who we have, Kelly Olnick. I mean, he, he did great in college. Don't get me wrong. But he did I don't on know, a team that was overrated. Yeah, I don't know how it's going to translate over because now he's not the biggest guy out there. Not, not by a long shot. Um, he was He had a decent shot. Mid level physicality, but like I want to, I want to see him match up out there with some of the bigs from the proven bigs from the NBA, and see how that turns out. I, I think they're taking the right steps though in the rebuilding process. Um, you got to get some presence down low after giving up KG, and you're right on that, Ricky. See, and I don't know. I'm looking right now, and I'm trying to figure out my winners of the draft. Yeah. One player though, I want to say before I get into that that I'm interested to see how he's going to translate to the NBA second round pick didn't go until the very end. Peyton Silva to, he goes to the Detroit Pistons who got the pick from the Clippers. You're saying you're leader of that national championship team in Louisville, the senior going to Detroit kind of in my mind, a bad situation. Well, it, the thing with Detroit is they've got a couple guards already, so I'm not sure how much time he'll actually see. And kind of last but not least to talk about the draft, I want to do a little winners and losers. I don't know if you guys have any. My one winner, Washington. They grab Otto Porter, played his uh, college career for two seasons at Georgetown, right in the D.C. area. And then they get a guy in the second round, trade from Philadelphia, Glenn Rice Jr., D-leaguer, should have been a first-rounder. Absolute steal in the second round. Yeah, uh, good value for your money there. And this is a guy who, like you said, he already put some playing time down in the D-League, so he's played with professional well, level and it's, guys. And it's a different story because usually you're like, oh, well, it's college kids. No, he went to the D-League first, had a little trouble in college. And am I saying Washington's going to be a playoff contender? No, but they made the right steps to maybe be there in the future. Yeah, they definitely have building box for it. My winner would be Portland. I think their first pick, first round pickup of uh, C.J. McCollum out of Lehi, great pickup. They they're trying to pair somebody up with uh, Lillard, and I think he's a phenomenal talent, and he can definitely bring some money to him. Uh, the other pickup they had in the first round was Alan Crabb, and this is the guy who I'm waiting to see come off the bench. See, I the one thing about Crabb that I feel like will kind of follow him is kind of the altercation that he had yeah. with his coach in college. How is that going to kind of carry over into the NBA? But in the NBA, one of those veteran players is going to push him and say, yeah, okay, new kid, shut up. Pretty much. I'm hoping somebody's going to knock him in place. Well, Because the coach can't do that. But behind closed doors, yeah. the other players are going to. I, I think that'll help him out environment-wise. Exactly. You're going to get somebody who says, you don't mess with the coach. Get back in line, kid. See, and I don't like, you say Portland, Dave. I'm going to steal your thunder a little bit. Their second-round pick. Jeff Witt, he kind of confused me because I'm like, how does, like, did you really need a backup center? No. So you just picked up Myers Leonard last year, so it's like, why would we need another center? I don't know, maybe, maybe he's got some potential. Um, put him on the bench for a while and let him, let him earn some time. I mean, it's like, it's a second rounder, honestly. It's like tossing the fish in the line out. Whatever you get, fantastic. I'm going to go a little different from both of you guys. Um, I'm going to talk about a team that is... Absolutely no different than they were two years ago, 
And then it's the Chicago Bulls. Ha. Exact same position they've been in. How? All along. We got Snell and Murphy. We added it's, two guys. You know what? We lost Nate Robinson. You know We're what not it the is? Exact same. We're letting guys leave from the bench role player area. The bench mob. And then they just add new guys who do the exact same thing. Sorry, I, d- I don't know what this bench area is you speak of. I only know of the bench mob. Yeah, you're right. It's just the same stuff. It's just a rotation of guys doing very similar very similar jobs. And we still can't achieve our ultimate goal because all they do is change out. You're right. They, they just keep swapping the bench rolls, and it's like, yeah, somehow this is going to get us to the championship. Eventually, this bench is going to get that championship victory. But but you got to take care of the real issue, which is we're paying too much money for Dang and Boozer. And until they change that, you're right. I think we're just going to sit around and, like, between, you know, top top four seeds of the Basketball uh, limbo? Yeah, and we're just going to can continual playoff contender, never winner. Exactly, and that is very unfortunate to see as a Chicago fan. I mean, we're going to put our trust in Thibodeau and hope that he can get something done, but right now, all I see, same position we've been in. Exactly. Well, last but not least to end the show, Dave, you actually went to a game last night. I did. A Major League Baseball game that made history. Well, yeah, we uh we were part of the beatdown that was responsible for 29 total runs, one off of the record in the live ball era. Really was rooting for it. Okay, uh, okay, Tim Kirkchen. Yeah, ESPN. Yeah. <laughs> it it was, I, I want to say painful, but towards the end we realized we we're closing in on the record and we started rooting for it. So Whichever wa- team was at so, bat, so, we were like, come on. So you wanted Cleveland to get five in the top of the ninth. We were rooting for any runs. I don't care who was at bat at that point. Honestly, the, the the beer guys are walking around and be like, come on, who wants to forget about this game and start drinking a little bit more? Got painkillers. It was like, so tempting. Uh, it was a fun game, though, to watch as far as offensive production goes. If you were a pitcher, I, I'm sorry. Or if you were the guy standing on the mound, regardless of if you were the pitcher or not. <laughs> Wait a couple. Of, yeah. Yeah, you know what you're talking about. But, I mean, there was one point where, because I was actually watching the game after you said that you were at the game. Yeah. And uh, uh, Alexi Ramirez making a, a little bit of an error. And what Gold did I, glove stop. You can't take that away what from did, him. What did, I, what did I text you? Alexi! Yeah, I was just a little bitching to my friends about this, and it's like, uh, he can make stops across the board. Fantastic plays. Throw the ball four feet. I'm sorry. That, that's, that's not something I can do. And it leads to something important with the White Sox we need to talk about. Fire sale. Anybody you want, give us an well, offer. You know, the trick. Except for, the except for tr- Chris the- Sale and Paul Canerico. They're you not know, going anywhere. Anybody else, you offer what, us a bag of cookies? What is Kenny Williams good at? Making deals at the trade deadline. It's coming up. Well, it's not Kenny Williams nowadays, per se. You know, he is now the uh, head of baseball operations or something. Whatever his fancy, title. Insert fancy title yeah, here. Yeah, basically, we had to bump him up so we could keep uh, his, his next in line man. But the whole thing is, it's like, okay, we've got talent together. They're not performing. we got to make a change. Who, who who gets dealt? I know you said Sale and Canerico are off the line. As Sox fans, who gets dealt? Who should get dealt? Honestly, right now, I could care a lot. I think our outfield is got potential to be a, just a, just fantastic outfield. I'd like to keep them intact. I think infield-wise, I like Gillespie. He's a young guy showing potential. Beckham coming off the injury, he seems like he's trying too hard. He's trying to make stuff happen. And it's just all falling apart in front of him. I, I wouldn't be terribly sad if he won. I, Alexei, whatever. As a Cub fan, can I throw can I throw two names out there and have you guys argue over it? Sure. Dunn and Alexei, two that need to go. Uh, the strikeout king, Adam Dunn. Um, I wouldn't mind if he left. It's just part of the tradition. We need to go out and find another past their prime lefty power hitter to replace him. Keep the tradition rolling. Uh, Alexei... If you look at stat line and completely ignore his play on the field, like don't watch him, just look at him from a numbers point of view. He looks like a great shortstop, but if you watch him play, it's maddening. Like you want to just go out there and shake him. What, Stop. What is, what is it with uh, <laughs> socks and shortstops? Because the last shortstop you had before Alexi Dave, you couldn't stand Juan Uribe, the choke artist. Yeah, it's a painful position to be in right now. Nobody's gonna want done, and we all want him gone. Um, I think Beckham should go. He's not doing anything worthwhile right now, and he's kind of uh, injury problems. I don't know who's going to take him, but get him off this team. 
Um, we need some kind of spark in our pitching rotation right now. That, that'd be nice after watching last night's games. <laughs> and watching did, Quintana start game two well, by loading the bases. And that's what like, I was going to yeah. say. You bring up Quintana. What if someone makes an offer for Quintana? Do you, I, I do like, you push the button? I ship like him. Quintana, ship but... No, I, I'd say keep him unless we get, like, a really, really solid offer. I, I'd like to keep Quintana. I'd like to think that as hard pitching goes, you keep Sale. Uh, hopefully keep PV, but he's one of those guys who I think could draw in some attention from other You're teams. You're talking about PV? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I think PV could draw some attention. I think Quintana could. I'd like to keep them. Uh, after that, yeah, we definitely need something there. Catching, I I think it's just a hilarious joke now after letting AJ go. How bad we needed him, absolutely was just a key part of this team. And now Flowers is I don't want to say failing at the role, but he's not putting up equal numbers to AJ. He's not. Did you expect him to be the next AJ? I did. I, th- I thought for a while he stopped the season so hot. I really was like, awesome. We just filled, replaced AJ, no issue. Let's keep rolling. But he, he's completely tanked off from that point. So, yeah, I say we go out, get some, get some prospects, and rebuild this team. I'm already in the mode of, yeah, whatever, let's rebuild. Pretty much. I mean, you can't disagree with you, Dave. We are a team that we got all this talent. It's not working. Something needs to change. We need the sparks. We need the young guys. It's time to rebuild, unfortunately. We just missed it. You know, just last year we were thinking we can make a run, and now it's all over. Yeah, I mean, it's just a matter of fact of, like you said, we got the pieces. It's just not coming together right for us, whatever may be the cause. So I think we need to, like, actually push for a rebuild. Because we after winning our championship, yeah, suck it, Cubs fans. Uh, okay, two thousand five. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's let's all hope for two thousand fifteen and Theo we trust. Yeah. Sure. Whatever. So I'm I'm just thinking we need to actually get a full rebuild and clean out the system because honestly we've been like oh we'll just swap a couple pieces here and there here and there and we're just being kept in like a level of decent team. Yeah, but how but long? Not great. How long if you say complete rebuild? How long until? You get back to that point. I think because we have the pitching in place already, as long as you know we keep PV, Sale, and Quintana. I say we got three starters right there. Perfect. We have a closer, and then you have to fill in the rest of it. But who like the thing? I'm the only problem I have with that is I feel like people are going to want Quintana. People might want PV. Yeah, PV. P, I'm afraid of him going. The other people but. that you say you have the core, just in those three too. I mean. People uh, are going to want the guys that yeah, like technically you want to keep, even though they're for sale. I know. I know. That That's the thing. It's like, I'd like to clean out our infield. I'd like to keep Canerico. Uh, the corners, fine. Canerico, Gillespie, keep them. And I, I think we've got to find a catcher who's more consistent than Flowers. Uh, the the middle of the infield, like, we went over. Alexei, gold glove, stops, can't throw the ball. Whatever happened to uh, doing the good old way through the farm system? We we don't do that really. Let's be honest about it. We need to just go. We need to take the Minnesota Twins farm system. Yeah, and like make everybody it your else. Own. Th- no, no, we just trade for it like everybody <laughs> else does. True. We just pillage their farm system. That's where talent comes from. Um. Yeah, but <laughs> <like> <laughs> that's where talent like it grows on trees in the Pretty Minnesota much, farm it's system. It's like pitching comes from Texas. It's just what happens. You don't True. question why. It just well, I mean, that come way. on, Nolan Ryan. Do you think they were gonna have weak pitching prospects? No, no. So. <laughs> Yeah, to look at the Mets now. They've got two great young pitchers, and that I guarantee you, like their season ticket sales just skyrocketed after those two guys. Yep. So I, I think we need to, yeah, try to replace some of our infield members and maybe look for some uh, uh, the the you know the four or five pitching roles in the middle middle relief pitchers. I like our outfield. I, I think if we could hold on to them, fantastic. Uh, yeah, I just want to replace Alexei and Beckham, I guess, and Flowers. So I got three spots. See, but in the Alexei and Beckham thing, I say you can get rid of them because what did you just draft in the first round of the MLB draft? A middle infielder. Is he going to come and play day one next season? No, but the future. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely high hopes for him. And I mean, moving from south side to north side, the Cubs making news. I know you're doing, happy. I am, I'm happier than a pig in slot because, I mean, Carlos Marmol designated for assignment. Oh, my God. The witch is dead. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. 
Yeah, the, the the bad nightmare is over finally. You don't have to just don't watch have, a lead just disappear. You don't know how many Cub games I've gone to where he comes in, everyone in the stands is like, oh, f- he's coming <laughs> in, loads the bases, walks a guy, walks a run here. Oh, there's a grand slam. Cubs lose the game. Yeah. You don't want to let him just kind of close a few more out for good measure to remember the good old days. I didn't even want him to be the setup man. <laughs> He can be my closer in in Daytona. That's where he can be my closer, in the farm system, way, way, way down there. Huh. He, he can't even play in Iowa. That's how much I hate him. And I, I think it's a great move for the Cubs. I mean, yeah, well, we most likely have to eat his salary. because Yeah, his contract is because quite I, large. I think the only thing the Cubs need to luck out on, will a team pick him up through waivers? No. No. Who wants Marmol? I think I know. I think someone will take him, but I think they'll wait until he goes free. That's what I'm saying. Who's yeah. gonna Who's gonna take him through waivers, and not just say, "Ah, we'll we'll get him through free agency." Yeah, because no one wants him. No, who's gonna want Marmol? He the guy can't get it done. I mean, I guess maybe you go, you pick him up for super cheap, mm-hmm. throw him in the farm system. Yeah, but you never know. Maybe no, maybe it's... a change of scenery will help. And, and you never know when an injury is gonna happen. There's always mm-hmm. a need for somebody who could pitch. Who could be that closer? Who could be that setup man, like you said? And we've seen guys come back from, you know, past their prime. After breaking Kerry Wood's arm in Chicago, he goes out and has a couple of good years with the Yankees. So, I mean... Comes back to the Cubs. Exactly. And uh, Keith Folk, after the Sox were done with him, goes out, wins a World Series with Boston. I and mean, there, there's no, like, final, you're done as a pitcher kind of thing. It's your arm's still attached to your body. You want to give it a go? Let's see what you got left. I think there will be some interest. Somebody out there will make a move on it. Is it going to be a bottom feeder? You don't know. It, who, who has an injury right now in, in their uh, bullpen? It comes down to how much money are the Cubs going to pay off that contract? True. They, you know, A team will pick them up for $1.5 million. Yeah, of course. Why not give that a shot? But nobody's going to pay that full, you know, nine point whatever. Yeah, million. nine point like eight million dollars. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm sure somebody will, somebody will be interested. It just depends on the price. Well, that's going to do it for our podcast this week. I want to thank everyone for listening. Tell us what you think down below with any of the topics we talked about today. We love conversing with you, the fan. I know we got a little bit of practice with that on our Bulls draft video. Glad to get the feedback. From this past week. That's going to do it for the podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Good night, everybody.